take this off. It's too warm today for to wear a coat. So, all right. You know, and one of the things we'll be speaking about um, today is how little things can become big things. Reminds me of, uh, maybe you remember that saying of um, the one couple who got married, they'd been married for many years. And they're, when they first got married, they were trying to decide how they were going to divide up the decision making. So they decided, I think you've heard this, the old one, of uh, they decided while well, the wife was going to make all the small decisions and the man was going to make all the big decisions. And he said, after 40 years of marriage, he said, I haven't had to make a decision yet. He said, apparently they've all been little decisions. So, yeah, little things. Little things too can become big things, even you think of, wow, we're, uh, you know, just one day at a time seem like little things, but it adds up soon to where's the year going? We got 91, you got 91 shopping days before Christmas. Uh, how quickly that's coming. All right. Uh, there's some message notes if you want to follow along on that. that I've entitled this, The Young and Restless Has Nothing on This. All right. I'd like to, uh, we're back again in Genesis 37 for the last time. We will move on to actually chapter 39 next time. We'll get a little further on in the story. But I want to reread just a couple parts of this. Genesis 39, beginning at verse 19, to get it fresh in our minds again. They said to one another, uh, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we'll see what become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. That's what he was thinking of doing. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, that multicolored robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and balm and myrrh on the way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and then they took Joseph to Egypt. All right, well, let's begin with prayer. Lord, again, thank you for this good morning. <clears throat> Thank you that we can gather here and read from your word and, and again we are reminded these are ancient words but how they've been preserved through all these years at great sacrifice so that we can read them and study them and apply them to this day because they are truth and so Lord help us to understand them and uh, help us by your spirit to apply them to our, our situations in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. You know, lies, uh, betrayals, uh, infidelities of the worst sort, uh, you know, sounds like another day in America. But really, all that's just coming out of the Bible, Genesis 37. Uh, do they still have soap operas on TV? Are they still on? I, I don't even know. I, I know uh, uh, there used to be one called The Young and the Restless. I don't know if it's still on or not. My mother used to watch that. I can remember when I was in the way back in high school and even in college come home for lunch my mother would watch that one I think she watched another one all my children or something and I can remember eating lunch and she'd be watching this and I can be thinking I can't believe anybody watched this stuff it's the same stuff over and over again you know so predictable it's the seamy side of life it's just one constant affair and betrayal and lies after another you know it just doesn't end well you know I, thinking about all that you know, I have to wonder after reading Genesis 37 if they didn't get some of their ideas from Genesis 37 and some of these stories. Uh, you know, a Joseph soap opera based on his life, I think, would probably be big today. It'd probably make, I mean, it's probably prime time stuff. 
Uh, I mean, there's more intrigue and more betrayals and lies here in this little section than his family than one can ever even imagine. So I want to look again, at, especially today, we're going to begin by looking at uh, one of the brothers, the oldest brother, Reuben. But I, that's not what I want to do with this. We're not just looking at his family to say, oh, isn't that interesting that happened? But as my main points show, the first thing we're going to look at is a betrayal that goes bad. But then we're going to look at wrong ways and the right ways to deal with betrayal. And then we're going to look at how sin causes, as you want to, if you want to think of it this way, calluses on one's heart. And then how does one deal with getting rid of those calluses or to keep that from happening? So uh, I don't want to just, you know, we're not just looking at this life, but what are some things we can take from this that are very practical to things we go through uh, in our day? All right. Point one I have on there, a betrayal goes bad. You know, uh, Reuben was Jacob's firstborn, his oldest son. He should have been uh, the head of the family. Uh, That's just the natural right. Uh, One guy wrote this, uh, let us hope that we are all preceded in this world by a love story. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, Reuben wasn't. Uh, His grandfather Laban deceived the little deceiver, Jacob, that's kind of his name meant, a deceiver, when after a night of, it was Jacob's wedding night, after a night of feasting and drinking, and uh, uh, Jacob goes, uh, you know, apparently he, apparently he was so out of it that he did not even know who he was sleeping with. Because he wakes up in the morning and says, hey, this, is, this isn't the one I was supposed to marry, this is Leah. You know, where's Rachel? And uh, he goes back to his, you know, to Laban and his uncle and and ask about this because in Genesis 29 it tells us uh, Jacob didn't love Leah, he loved Rachel. So you have Reuben being uh, Leah's oldest son being the uncherished son of an uncherished wife. I mean just a recipe for all kinds of bad things happening. You know many times in life that kind of scenario though has played out. I was, you know, where the older brother should have received everything but doesn't, some younger brother does, I'm told. I've never seen, uh, uh, like, you know, I, I guess they're kind of classics, but, you know, the, the Godfather films. I'm not sure how many there are, though. I've never seen them. But I know someone was telling me once that, that this scene kind of plays out in that, where the younger son, Michael, uh, gets, becomes kind of the head of the family, you know, the, the mob there, the mafia, and the older brother is running around shouting and saying, I'm supposed to be in charge. I should be getting all the respect. And so Michael, the younger brother, has his older brother removed from the family, if you know what I mean there. So, but that kind of thing ha- happens throughout and has happened many times. But what's interesting is that since uh, uh, Reuben could not measure up to Joseph, that's the son that uh, Jacob really preferred. <clears throat> Since he couldn't measure up to Joseph in his father's eyes, what does he do? He tries to get rid of Jacob, the father. It's a classic power play. Uh, do you remember the story of Absalom? Uh, I think it's way back Second Samuel 16. He was one of David's sons. Well, he was tired of waiting, you know, to become king, or, and he wanted to become king, so he says it's time, and he ends up, you know, what does he do? He uh, basically, he runs David out of Jerusalem. And then what does he do? A very interesting thing. We may think it's kind of odd, but what he does is he sets up a tent on a, in a very public spot on the roof of a building so everyone could see it. And then he ends up and he sleeps with all of David's wives and mistresses. That was his way of saying, I'm in charge now. You know, I'm in control now. David's out. It was his way of publicly humiliating his dad. And Reuben does the same thing. Uh, Back in Genesis 35, verse 22, it says that while his dad was away, while Jacob was out, Reuben goes and he sleeps with one of his father's wives, Bilhah. And, uh, And it says this, and this is key. It says that Jacob heard about this. Why is that key? It's key because Jacob, the father, hears what Reuben had done, and he does nothing about it. He doesn't do anything about it. Why? Why, why wouldn't he do something about this huge 
betrayal. Well, it doesn't really say. I think you could think of some various ideas. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, by now Jacob was an old man. Uh, he was known, already well known for his moral weakness, uh, uh, letting his wives really kind of push him all around, all four wives, uh, which is another big problem, uh, polygamy. Uh, if, he challenged, if he had challenged Reuben, perhaps, maybe, uh, you know, since what if the others knowing about Jacob's faults, maybe what would happen if they actually sided with Reuben? Jacob would be out. He didn't dare take that chance. Uh, in many ways, Jacob had already lost some moral authority in his home. He was still the father, he was still kind of the head, but he had lost his moral authority. And I, I think he just kind of felt powerless to act. I think he was paralyzed by his past, as so many people are. I mean, all of us are products of our past. Can't avoid that. But he was really paralyzed by it. And, you know, so he did nothing. I think just kind of hoping it would just go away. You know, how often does that happen? You know, how many people have had a big problem? And instead of doing something about it, instead of doing the right thing, they do nothing, and they just kind of hope it goes away, please. But it never does, does it? Usually it just gets worse. Well, and, and, you know, if someone criticizes you, that's one thing. Lots of times criticism, you know, you can let that go. You know, they may call you names or something. A lot of that you can just... You just let it slide. You can't chase after all that stuff. There'll be no end. But when someone, when there's this kind of open betrayal, that needs to be dealt with. Because everyone knows about it. And they're wondering what you're going to do about it. So application point two, a wrong and right response to betrayal. You know, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have been betrayed in one way or another. That's pretty common in life. You live long enough that happens at workplace or all, all kinds of places. Uh, betrayals that go on every single day. And, uh, and for one thing, betrayals usually don't just drift away. They, use, they have to be dealt with in love and biblically, which would be loving as well. But, and if they're not dealt with, a certain iciness can kind of drift into the relationship, or it's kind of like a, a cold frost can blow on the relationships at work, or it's like a cold north wind, if you want to look at it, you know, kind of blows in your face. You both know what happened, you both know that each other knows, but nothing is done about it. It's just allowed to fester. And, you know, for, for Reuben and Jacob, life was never the same again after he had done that. It's like in any small town. Uh, there's one saying goes, around here, it's hard for an interesting secret to stay secret. You know, this is the secret that, uh, you know, everyone knows about, but everyone doesn't, doesn't know what to do about it. Uh, that's the wrong way to deal with it. To ignore it, just be silent about it, let's just hope it just kind of goes away. Of course it doesn't. Again, it usually gets worse. Uh, there's a classic book, uh, maybe some of you read it, or parts of it, uh, Canterbury Tales by Chaucer and many hundreds of years ago. He has a line in there that, that says this, a guilty man thinks everybody only talks of him. Which is not true. Uh, you may, the guilty person usually thinks that, but it's really not true because people generally are too wrapped up in themselves and they're really thinking about themselves. But uh, think of in Reuben's situation after what he had done. Imagine every time Reuben would walk into camp, you know, how guilty he must feel knowing what he'd done to his father, knowing his brothers know, wondering if they're all talking about him. You know, secrets have a power to them. And it's always a destructive power. It's always a deforming power. Um, they hurt us. And this badly kept secret to Reuben, sleeping with one of his father's wives, really you can see it, how it, it lies as one of the big explanations for all his later behavior. And the things he does after that you can be traced back to what he did here. Uh, so his plan, Reuben's plan to replace his dad didn't work. Uh, and he ends up, uh, you know, not only did he not get what he wanted, but he lost favor. Lost favor with his dad, lost favor with his brothers. I mean, think of it. Uh, I wonder what Dan and Naphtali thought. Dan and Naphtali are two of his brothers. 
and their, their mother was Bilhah. Um, I wonder what they thought of their brother sleeping with their mother. Talk about dysfunctional family. And I'm just giving you the PG version. The Bible goes into a lot more detail and graphic more than I'm maybe comfortable with. Uh, so I'm, I'm toning it down here for you. Um, so, you know, the, the, the wrong way to deal with betrayals is to keep them secret. Because uh, the truth always eventually comes out anyway. It just does. Uh, the right way is to deal with it openly, with, uh, with honesty, with transparency, you know, coming clean with those who need to know. You don't a advertise your dirty laundry to the world. You, to those who were affected by it, those are the ones that you need to come clean with. If it's just one person, it's just one person. If it's two, you know, what, whoever is affected. Like the prodigal son finally did. Remember how he took his share of his inheritance, went off, blew it on fast living, and uh, wine, women, and song, and he blows it all, and now he's in worse shape than ever, and he, it says he, come, he finally came to his senses. There's a lot of people out there yet have not come to their senses. The prodigal son finally did, and he says, you know, I, you know, my own dad's servants have it better than this. I'm going back, and I'll, I'll just confess everything, and I'll apologize, and and so he heads back and he's, you know, he has that heart attitude and his dad, what a great testament to his dad. You know, it's a picture of our loving Heavenly Father who sees him coming from a long ways off, so it means he was looking for him, sees his son and he drops everything. He runs out there and he hugs his son and his son he just says, will you forgive me? And the dad forgives him and throws him this big homecoming party. I mean, it's just a, this beautiful example of the right way to deal with these types of things. Forgiveness and uh, openness uh, take away the power of a secret to control us. Uh, in many ways, you could say, you are your secrets. And don't do as the world does. The world only lets you know the good things about yourself. They let those things be broadcast. All the bad things they keep secret. But you, you are your secrets. Psychologically, you are your secrets. And so let your secrets then be good things. Deal with these types of things, with whoever needs to be dealt with. Get them out and uh, let your secrets be good things. Well, you know, even later when Reuben was planning to uh, uh, save Joseph, I think the primary reason why he was trying to was that he was trying to earn his way back into his father's good graces. Remember he said, don't kill Joseph, put him in this pit. His plan was to come back later and get Joseph out and return him to his dad. That's why he was shocked when they had, he finds out they had sold him. Uh, but he, he's trying to get back into somehow earning his way back in to his father's favor. I mean, so it really wasn't about saving Joseph, it was about saving Reuben. It was about himself. And, um, you know, that's, that's what sin always is. Sin always, it's always, it's always about me. It's all about me, is what sin is. And only forgiveness, only being transparent and honest can restore a broken relationship. Or at least... The, give it the best chance to be restored. All right. Uh, point three on here. Sin builds calluses on your heart. So we have to ask this question. Now who's going to step up now to be the head of the family? Reuben's out. He's the oldest. Naturally, normally it would fall in on him. He's out. What he did to his father, he's done. The next two up are, are, are Simeon and Levi. They would be the next two oldest. They completely disgraced themselves with what I talked about last week, how they went in and because of what the men, or guy had done in the town of Shechem and how they, what they had done to their sister Dinah. And uh, so they went in and they, at a right opportune time, they slaughtered the men there and stole their stuff. So they had disgraced themselves. So they're out. Uh, next up would be Judah. He, number four in line. Uh, what about him? You know, it says in, in the chapter that we read, it says, you know, he said, let's not kill him, let's sell him. Well, maybe he wasn't so bad. Well, uh, not really. Uh, the Bible shows us his true character in the next chapter, chapter 38. Kind of interesting. This whole saga is about, you know, Jacob's, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then, the, you know, through Joseph, and how they got into Egypt, and then how the Lord brought them out of Egypt. 
And, uh, but chapter 38 doesn't deal at all with Joseph or anything. It all deals with Judah. Now, you know, so I kind of went, why, why this one whole chapter stuck in here on Judah? But anyway, the Lord wanted this in here. It tells us a lot about what, what Judah was like and what his character was like. And I, without going into all the details, because uh, uh, it gets graphic, but Judah basically, uh, his wife dies. And so he's a widower. And it says he goes into a nearby area and he, he, uh, uh, he goes and visits a, um, which was somewhat common back then, a, a temple prostitute in a pagan religion. So he's not even following in the faith of his father's footsteps. He's left that. Um, or at least he's, he's anyway, he's, he goes off and he does this. And what, and that how it, the problem is, gets complicated is that then this gal turns out to be his daughter-in-law. And who was in disguise, this daughter-in-law who Judah had, had deceived and was not fair to her, was not just to her because uh, her husband had died, and, uh, which was one of Judah's sons. And the law back then demanded that he would, if he had another son, that he would give that son to marry her. And again, again we're not, you know, this isn't 21st century America. This is just the way things were done back then. And he was supposed to, wasn't just a nice thing, he was supposed to then give his next son to her. He didn't do it. He said, I'll do that. He didn't do it. So she's kind of calling him on it. And that's kind of all I need to go into with, with that. But I mean, think of it. You have cheating, you have lying, you have uh, incest, you have deception, all in one verse, one sentence. Uh, I mean, I told you, the soap operas today have nothing on, on this. Uh, some of the stuff here. Well, now, knowing a little bit of Judah's true character now, the things he did, he's a liar, deception. Um, it gives us a little insight into why he did what he did back in chapter 37, where he said, let's not kill Joseph, let's just sell him. You would think, well, uh, what we discover is that really it wasn't... Um, you know, it may appear that maybe he's trying to be nice to Joseph, you know, and not killing him. Really, again, it was just all about Judah. It was all about himself. It was about, hey, here's a way now that we, I can keep Joseph's blood off my hands. So I'm not a murderer. And I can make some money at it at the same time. What a deal. And so that's what they do. And we see his character when he goes along fully with the lie to deceive their father about what happened, really happened to Joseph. So, I mean, it's like father, like son. I mean, there's just deception all around. And so uh, they take Joseph's coat and they uh, dip it in some goat's blood and they, uh, you know, they show it to their dad saying, you know, we found this coat. This isn't, is this Joseph's coat? They all knew it was Joseph's coat. And his dad recognized it and said, oh, and, you know, my son Joseph has been killed by an animal. And he goes into mourning. He basically is dying a thousand deaths every single day dying over you know, what his, his, his favorite son had died. And uh, here, here the brothers sit there and they watch their dad suffer day after day for what they know is a lie. How could they become so callous? Well, sin does that. We get used to it. Uh, we get in so deep that sin builds calluses on our hearts, so to speak, if you want to call it that, and we just lose all tenderness, we lose all mercy. Uh, our hearts become hard. You know, there's no compassion there. Uh, five chapters later in Genesis, uh, after Joseph becomes a leader in Egypt, and he has this opportunity to put some of his brothers in prison, just to kind of see how they would react, there's an interesting verse that sheds light on some of this. Now let me just read it in chapter 42, 21. Here's brothers, they're down in Egypt and they're saying to one another, then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, Joseph, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us now. So let's back up for a second. They throw Joseph into a pit, 
And then they go a few feet away, as I read earlier, and they sit down and they have lunch. All the while, Joseph is just a few feet away. He's screaming, saying, get me out of here. Don't leave me here. Rescue me. And they're like saying, hey, pass the salt. What? Uh, I can't hear you. Joseph is shouting and crying so much. I wish he'd just be quiet so we could have a nice peaceful lunch. How could they be so callous? Like they said, we heard his cries. We didn't listen. Well, so again, we, can, we see how, how callous their hearts really were. Sin does that. You know, and the sad thing, it, it does that to everyone who has sinned. You know, you wonder sometimes you, whether you see it in, <clears throat> excuse me, in movies, but or things you read or hear, how some of these uh, jailers, whether it be in, you know, communist countries or whatever, how could they be so mean? How could they be so merciless to their prisoners? Well, I think of a person who just sins repeatedly and they never repent, their hearts just get harder and harder and harder and more callous and more callous until it comes a time, I think, where they just are incapable of showing any mercy or any compassion. It's just not there. It's gone. And I have to say, in the same way, if we can't hear the cries of those who are hurting, uh, maybe we need to get our hearts checked for calluses too. Especially, or to apply it even closer, if we are, if, if, if the honest cries of people in our own family, if that doesn't bother us, and then something has really gone wrong in our own hearts. Well, last point here, application on this. How to get rid of and keep calluses off our heart. So, meanwhile, all this time, Joseph, he's on his way to uh, Egypt uh, to be sold as a slave. It was bitty, bitter, bitterness, envy, you know, all these jealousy, hatred, all these things that really sent him there. And, you know, a, hard, a heart doesn't become hard or calloused overnight usually starts out small, small things. You know, a little white lie told here, a little uh, uh, covetousness, a little envy over, some, over something else, uh, some stuff somebody has or a relationship they have, or maybe you just like your brother. And you would never think of killing your brother, but you know, over time things go, things change, uh, and uh, our hearts become harder. It gets to where uh, you do just about anything or sink to any level. Even torturing your own father with a lie. That's what they were doing here. It sunk so far. And so, and, and yet that happens a lot today. We see two others suffering needlessly because somebody didn't put a watch over their own heart. Instead of being open, instead of being transparent, they harbored secrets, and with it the shame that comes with that. You know, and if you find yourself in the middle of any of this kind of process, uh, forgiveness is the only way out. It's the only way I know all of that. Uh, it begins by asking Jesus to forgive us of our many sins first, of course. And that takes honesty, it takes humility, it takes a uh, openness. And actually, that's too much for many people. They won't do that. Uh, they'd rather just deny it, they'd rather hide it, they'd rather downplay it rather than come clean. And none of those other ways work. All those other ways will kill you. So come clean with Jesus. He knows all about it anyway. Uh, you know, you would think that, you know, or let me put it this way. You know, do you think that he doesn't know what, you're, what you did or that he doesn't know what you're thinking even right now? He knows what you're thinking right now far better than you know what you're thinking. Oftentimes our own thoughts sometimes can be kind of muddled or whatever. To him, it's crystal clear. Come clean with him. He knows all about it anyway. You're not hiding anything. You're trying to run from something. Come clean with Christ. And uh, confess your sins to him. And experience his forgiveness, his cleansing, and a, a fresh start in life. Who doesn't want that? And you know, not only that, it doesn't, doesn't stop there. You have to keep applying the gospel to yourself every single day. It's not just one time, it's done, it's over. No, you've got to keep applying the, the gospel message of grace and mercy and forgiveness to yourself every single day and to your relationships every day. It's an ongoing thing. Uh, again, transparency, forgiveness, they're, the, they're part of the backbone for a healthy 
relationship. Um, we often don't like this because we want the other person to make the first move. Uh, you know, we think, I didn't do anything, they did it, they said it, I didn't say anything, they said it, they need to come to me, they need to make the first move. And at that point, it's totally beside the point, who started, who what, or who's going to make, you know, at that point, the relationship is so hurt that it might've, they might have started it, but if that's the way our attitude is, we're just as guilty in all ourselves. And uh, we need to, uh, to be willing to, you know, or let me say this, God is not going to hold you responsible for what they do or don't do. God is going to hold you responsible for what you do. So you be the real man, you be the real woman, and you take the initiative and, uh, and to try through forgiveness, through openness, through honesty, to get that relationship restored. Um, because remember, who, we're very grateful that God took the initiative with us, aren't we? He didn't sin, we did. And yet he's the one who took the initiative to come to us. That's our example. Doesn't All this stuff, well, I'm, I'm going to wait for him, is all totally beside the point, totally meaningless. Yes, there's a relationship that's not right. Be the right, you know, be the man, the woman, to do the right thing and seek to get that relationship restored. You know, but sometimes, again, we don't like to, I think, you know, well, it might get kind of messy, it might be kind of awkward, or it might take time. Yeah, it probably will. Probably will take some time, and it will, might get messy, and it might get awkward. Uh, but at least it's worth it. At least then you're on the pathway to getting better rather than staying in this death spiral that you're in. So, or, you know, a lot of times today, too, people like instantaneous forgiveness, you know, like, like we see on the TV show, you know, it's a 30-minute show and something happens and somebody does something dumb and now all of a sudden then they forgive one another and it's all done and resolved in 30 minutes. Wow, who knew that you could do all that that fast? Well, real life doesn't usually work that way. Uh, you, it would be nice if you could just push delete and have all the ugly stuff of your past, of, you know, uh, in terms of relationships, be, you know, gone, dealt with. Um, but usually, I mean, forgiveness is very powerful and it's very necessary, but usually, you know, trust has been broken. It takes time to rebuild trust. Um, it takes time to rebuild a broken life. That doesn't just happen in 30 minutes. But at least, again, it's worth it because you're on the pathway up to, to being restored. And so, again, that's part of why we do it. Because, again, Jesus did it. So sitting there at home fretting about it, sitting there at home being anxious about it is a bad way to deal with it. It's the wrong way It doesn't because it doesn't deal with it at all. Um, I mean, how often does that go on? So it's basically when we do that, when it's so common... You know, basically, you're just punishing yourself over and over again. The other person, they might have, they might not even be around anymore. They might be dead and gone. Or they might have moved away. That they might have can't even remember what they did. But you keep it alive, and you keep punishing yourself. Why do we love to do that? In this Joseph story, you know, with all this mess, all this dysfunction, and, and you know, soap opera kind of living going on, there there does come a time of massive forgiveness, and it's beautiful. But that's at the end of the story. We're not there yet. Let me just close. Uh, Francis Fenelon was a guy who was a, a Christian mentor to the uh, kids of King Louis the Fourteenth back in France uh, several hundred years ago. And he he takes this verse in the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, chapter two, where he says it's you know it's the little foxes that spoil the vines, and he compares it to how it's the little things in life that often spoil things. It's whether it be something we say, you know, the, our daily decisions, the daily interactions we have with others, that see small things that often determine the course of our lives. Just as little sins, little things, uh, can spoil life, so can little things. Uh, uh, little acts of grace, little acts of virtue can build a good life. Um, you know, asking for forgiveness, being willing to offer forgiveness are acts that help build a life. So uh, remember how Jesus told us to pray too in the Lord's Prayer. He says, you know, it has us to pray, Father, forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. There's our example. So could it be this week, maybe, that there might be some little acts, such as forgiveness, something like that, that you can do or you can offer someone else that will help keep them from enduring this kind of soap opera pain uh, that we see all around us? And if so, don't begrudge those little opportunities or as interruptions. Rather, uh, uh, embrace them. Uh, be open to them. Look for them even and embrace them heartily. Because again, it's, it's these little things that can make or break a life. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this was a, a tough one in the sense that we see all the brokenness and deception going on in this family. And yet you chose to work through them, and that's amazing. And that gives us hope, too, that you can still use us. And Lord, use us in ways, too, where maybe we can help others who are going through that kind of a soap opera life that we could maybe encourage them to, to come clean with you first and then do what, what needs to be done to, to get on the path to healing and being restored and restoring trust and, and where the joy can, can come back in our relationships again and rebuild things rather than trying to hide these things and keeping secrets which are all also destructive. And that's what our enemy would want us to do. It's not what you'd want us to do. And Lord, this isn't easy, and it's, and it's very humbling, and yet it's very liberating. And it's, very, uh, it's following in your footsteps, who took the initiative, who uh, first loved us. And we're very, again, grateful for that. So Lord, in this new week, help us to be open and look for opportunities for, again, little things that perhaps we can do, a word we can say, an act we can do, acts of grace and mercy and compassion that might help others, too, to... Uh, realize that things are not all hard and dark and despair in this world. There is hope, and that hope is in you. So thank you for this morning, and I pray all this again now in Jesus' name.